Hello, and welcome to the NVR podcast. A little bit unusual that I'm starting the program, but that's for a good reason. I would like to um, begin the uh, first podcast of season three by introducing uh, my dear colleague, Jill Lubienski, who um, who will be one of two colleagues who will share in delivering the podcast together with me. The other colleague being Shilla Desai, whom you will meet in due time. Jill, do you just want to say one or two words about yourself? Yes, thanks, Peter. Um, so hello, everybody. Um, I'm Jill, um, and I'm, a, I'm employed by Partnership Projects as a family therapist and a supervisor and trainer and have worked with I've worked with Peter for many years and um, he's a dear dear friend a dear colleague and it's a great pleasure to be able to have these conversations uh, with you Peter and I'm looking forward to today and I am looking forward to today and and many further podcasts that we will uh, I hope do together so anyway Jill, um, we um, we discussed what we'd like to talk about, and you quoted the title of a song uh, of a very uh, popular uh, song called "What's Love Got to Do with It?" And um, could you just could you just share how we got to that theme and what it's about? Yes. So I had a, a, a song that would be familiar to many people going round in my head, a little earworm. <laughs> um, you don't, you don't want to sing it, do you? No, I think I'll just um, everybody <laughs> that one. Um, something so, like, what love got to do, got to do with it, something like that. Isn't that's it? A, who needs me to sing it, Peter? <laughs> that's exactly right. So it's repetitive, isn't it? What's love got to do, got to do with it? And it just um, stayed in my head. And I suppose, you know, it's when you I'm working with families and training practitioners and the and I was just thinking about family relationships and how where does love go sometimes for our parents, their sense of um, looking for an answer through the intellect, I suppose, and then the diminution, if you like, if that's the right word, of, of the of the heart, the obscuring of love because of what's gone on in the family and I was looking at I've got a little book of Martin Luther King speeches which I sometimes look at because they're quite inspirational and I opened it randomly and I think it must have been fortuitous because I, I want to just read you this little paragraph that um, Martin Luther King wrote as a maybe that can spur us to think more about these ideas so Martin Luther King says at the centre of non-violence stands the principle of love. The non-violent resistor would contend that in the struggle for human dignity, the oppressed people of the world must not succumb to the temptation of becoming bitter or indulging in hate campaigns. To retaliate in kind would do nothing but intensify the existence of hate in the universe. Along the way of life, someone must have sense enough and morality enough to cut off the chain of hate. This can only be done by projecting the ethic of love to the centre of our lives. So that just really spoke to me, I suppose, about how we might, as practitioners, privilege this idea of love as a guiding principle for us. And I just wondered, Peter, what What's coming to mind as I'm talking about this? Is there anything for you in that? Well, I think uh, it's a very powerful statement. Um, there are so many things that come to my mind. So many aspects, so many dimensions. Um, I guess the, the one thing that came to my mind listening to that quote uh, was the question of anger. Uh, when when people experience injustice, when they are 
constrained unduly or oppressed or when they are harmed, they often feel anger. And anger then becomes a driver or the feeling of anger. I'm not speaking about uh, acting aggressively, but that emotion becomes a driver um, to do something about it. And I'm just, I was just thinking, gosh, so is that anathema to loving uh, resistance? Uh, or, or how do we reconcile both? Mm -hmm. um, I imagine Martin Luther King will sometimes have felt angry. How, how was he able, on the one hand, for his feeling of anger to motivate him, to let it, his, his, his angry emotion motivate him, and by the same token, nurture in himself that loving kindness and inclusiveness. You know, Martin Luther King had no enemies. The civil rights movement had no enemies. You know, when he spoke of liberation, he spoke of liberation of African-Americans and white Americans from racism. It was as if racism was the enemy not any people. Uh, very similar to the way in which in narrative therapy we externalize a problem. So that is one of many things that came to my mind mm. uh, and how parents that we work with often say, I love my son, my daughter, my child, but I, I can't like them. And that makes me feel very sad. So it's as if they lost that access to that loving voice. They know it's still there. Mm -hmm. They've yeah. lost it somehow. So that was something that came to my mind. I don't. I didn't have any sort of conclusive mm -hmm. thoughts about mm -hmm. it. I don't know what you feel? Yeah, I, I, I'm just really interested in all of those things you've just talked about, really. Oh. And I was just thinking, oh, where shall I? Where shall I start? But I, I'm, I think, yeah, that, that theme of anger and how that becomes a driver, you know, the feeling that drives mm -hmm. perhaps angry and critical and dismissive and, you know, more hate, if you like. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, parents don't like the children actively behave in ways that they would wish rather they didn't, driven yes. by that anger, yeah. don't they? And which feeds into, you know, self-destructive, self-critical beliefs about about themselves and I know you've spoken and and written about that sense of um, a parent feeling they don't matter and I wonder the connection between the the, the driver of angry and um, you know actions the parent might regret to that sense of not mattering as the child then distance themselves and the parent becomes more distant and the sense of who I am as a, as a human being and a parent towards my child yeah. gets eroded more and more so I think that's a really important sort of theme and then with with how we are as NVR practitioners I'm thinking about you know you talked about Martin Luther King also feeling anger and and yet having no enemies and that yeah. highly evolved kind of position that he Ooh. that he took and you know attempted to bring people along in that in that way and he talks about Martin Luther King talks about the integration of the mind and the heart he said, if you're too soft hearted, you know, soft, it isn't about just being soft hearted and, you know, giving in and being, you know, unable to move because you're so kind of um, all heart. And neither is it being driven just by the head, which can also lead you in the wrong direction. But how we integrate the two, the heart with the mind. So I think in our society, the mind is very strong, but the heart is withered a bit <laughs> you know we we need to practice practices of the heart with our parents i think so when when you reference martin luther king and speak about um you, you know it, it's necessary not just to be soft-hearted or actually it's not about soft-hearted 
that loving response I, i'm just curious what 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 your thoughts are around that whether you i think i mean about yeah i think it's about you know he he also talks about the paralysis of analysis that um he says there's the fierce urgency of now mm -hmm. the fierce urgency of now and i i kind mm -hmm. of really like that in a way because in NVR, we, we have these methods of action, don't we? And, mm -hmm. you know, moving parents into this doing is such mm -hmm. a, you know, it, it's it's what we do. But a lot of our our services, I think, sit in that paralysis of analysis, mm -hmm. you know, of which diagnosis shall we offer to the family? You know, the where NVR adds something is that, we take into account all of that, you know, yes, the child might have challenges in different ways and, but it doesn't stop us thinking about the fierce urgency that something needs to be done now and how a parent can move, actually physically move away from that paralysis into action that brings about more of a, um, the sense of, I am the parent and I, and I, won't have that taken away from me I will reclaim my sense of feelings feeling that I love you feeling I mean we might not talk in that way but that's the kind of I see it as the kind of reason that we're doing this moving helping our parents move more into a position of loving their child reclaiming that reclaiming their, their love for their child so if at some point anger can be a motivating emotion. Yeah. It becomes transformed in some shape or form. And, <laughs> and there's something about um, the parent resisting in the here and now. Um, the problematic, the harmful behavior, the self-destructive behavior of the child. Um, and at the same time, reclaiming their entire parental position. So reclaiming or positions, reclaiming the position of guidance, being someone who gives guidance to their child, reclaiming the position of someone who is sometimes a boundary yeah and reclaiming the position of someone who um who provides loving care yeah which is so often rejected and and dismissed and and you mentioned that sense of erasure where mm -hmm. the child has dismissed the parental care more than anything so if if anger becomes determination it can also be determination to re-establish loving care whilst at the same time re-establish a relationship in which the parent can give guidance and at the same time the parents become boundaries mm. in themselves towards their child would that would that sort of fit with what you're thinking i think that's so beautifully put i love the way that you've kind of broken that up into all those lovely parts those distinctions so it's many things that we might be aiming for with this it's a guiding principle it's a you know we talk we don't talk in therapy much or any of our work about love do we we don't mm -hmm. specifically say i'm you know here today for this session with you as parents let's see let's talk more about love <laughs> you know we're always talking in different ways but if we as practitioners are able to kind of have that as a a kind of an open heart to our families, you know, to think about all of the things we're doing within NVR are in that frame of nonviolent resistance, all about reclaiming love. Mm. I, I was just thinking, something just popped into my mind as I was uh, listening to you, and I was thinking about, you know, how closely anger and loving care can sit uh, for example, when we worry about our child, 
And I, I remember one time we were um, mountaineering, my sons and I, and um, in, in Scotland, in the Highlands, and I couldn't see one of my sons in, uh, in the fog. And there'd been a recent bereavement in our family. And I felt angry and I got angry at him. You know, to my disgrace, I shouted at him when I saw him again. Yet it was that that anger was driven by so many other things. My concern for him, my fear of loss, you know, my, my, my worry that he might come to harm, you know. And um, parents often feel that when their children, when they're usually adolescent children, run away, mm -hmm. you know. And I was reminded of a woman I spoke with one time who told me about her teenage years when she said that um, she went off the rails a bit. And she would come home in the early hours of the morning, having done drink, having done drugs. And her dad, who at that time had not been familiar with NVR, you know, but was probably a natural, was sitting there at three in the morning, reading a newspaper with a cup of coffee to stay awake. <laughs> and he would look at her and he said, He'd say to her, well, this is not okay, but um, you need to get your sleep. And I've, I've, there's, some, there's some food on the stove. And um, if you, you know, I made you some whatever, chicken soup. Um, and we'll talk about it tomorrow. And she said it was impossible over time not immediately, but over time, it was impossible to keep doing what she was doing with that response that he persisted with. And I was just imagining how we can think of this father as no longer feeling angry, but having been, having moved into a into feeling concern for his daughter, but at the same time having an iron determination that he wasn't going to yield to what she was doing to herself. And how she described that as making a real difference over time. It's just something that came to my mind just now. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, again, that's, that's such a great example, Peter, you know, that iron determination <laughs> that she felt from her her dad and how that was trans as you just you, the word you use transformative which mm -hmm. is where we're going where we're really hoping you know at the highest level of our work we're offering something transformative in the relationship between parents and and their children really important i think and it, it makes me think you know that persistence that's required and also what you what you've reminded me of in the way that you spoke then was how within our therapy sessions with parents, the practitioner can do an awful lot by really slowing things down. And mm -hmm. like you just did then on picking, you know, really showing the little, the lines of resistance and um, determination and the transformation by, you know, having that slightly outsider position, you can have that perspective of, you know, these are all the actions of NVR and what is that creating more of in the relationship? And diminishing it's so it's such a great example so there's something in in that um the position of the practitioner um as somebody who's able to access their own <laughs> heart <laughs> to yeah. be able to see those important developmental steps that parents might not notice themselves yeah. I, I was just thinking that what you've just said seems to me to speak to something very important, which is that connection between the loving care of the parent and their agency. So you, you, you spoke about how mm -hmm. in a therapy session with a parent, you will look at that, you know, in, in 
almost sometimes in, in microscopic detail. Yes. You'll, you'll look at what they have done, how they have done it, what the meanings are that yes. they, or together with you in conversation, uh, may attribute to what they've done. And in that process, get in touch with their own agency and the sense that they will be able to act with agency in the future, what uh, mm -hmm. uh, in cognitive psychology has been called self-efficacy expectation, that expectation that I'll be able to do it. And I'm sort of thinking with that sense of agency, how then the there can be an opening for the loving kindness yeah so when i no longer experience myself as a victim as the parent then i don't have to be angry anymore i don't need a fight reaction yeah. just like i don't need a flight reaction and i don't need to have fright you know and and become uh, paralyzed I know I can act and with getting in touch with that knowledge that I can act, I think when I'm then no longer feeling like a victim of my child, I can get in touch with that lovingness yeah. towards my child. Yeah, absolutely. I, again, you've, <laughs> you expand the idea and take it to places that are mm. so helpful. I think for, for me as a, uh, a therapist, uh, other people out there, I'm sure, will find that incredibly helpful, Peter. I, I, and I and I really that really resonates with me that whole idea of you know parents taking action and in that frame of you know not not in anger but with that sense of I'm doing something different here. The transformation that you talk about in every step that's carefully planned and that we need to you know we. I'm always saying this in supervision. I'm always saying this when I'm working with in training, you know, go slower to go faster. You know, yeah. That sort of slow it down, take your time, unpick, really emphasize, amplify those moments when the parent is doing something really important and it's doing, it's a doing. Yes. The dad that you described, who sits quite calmly, quietly, mm. might seem like nothing, <laughs> but yeah. there's layers and layers and layers. And then that that kind of reflexive loop that comes back to the therapist, you know, in, in 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 our work, one of the things that I found with NVR is it's helped me as a therapist to unstick myself because because of the processes that take place as you're doing this work, it loops back on on you as a therapist to think, what more can I see here? What more can I, you know? do to help this parent. So there's, a, there's a kind of ethic of generosity, you know, that goes alongside, I think, with this work. An open heart from the practitioner, generosity to the parent, which the parent, you know, with that persistence shows the child to be even more generous <laughs> next mm -hmm. time in my response. I'm intrigued by what you're saying right now, because of course you're bringing us the therapist or mm. practitioner or parenting practitioner or whatever our title may be, you're bringing us into the equation. Mm. And you, you said something earlier, I don't remember it, the exact words that you used, but you said something about, um, I guess, feeling well disposed towards mm. the parent. Mm. And you've now spoken about us getting ourselves unstuck mm. on picking ourselves <laughs> um and i was just thinking that how positive many sessions in nvr can feel mm. i mean we're working with such dire problems aren't we we're working with violence aggression destructiveness not just by the child mm. often that you know the child may have experienced that the parent may have experienced that adoptive parents experience vicariously uh, from the interaction with their child yet 
we come out of many sessions uh, feeling pretty good. Yeah, yeah. And our, I guess, the way we're disposed towards the parents and by extension towards their children. Yeah. Um, I, I think can carry a, a kind of warmth and mm -hmm. acceptance. Mm -hmm. I, I've just been rambling. Uh, no, it's not. I, 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 you see, I, I feel this is really important. And it might be connected for me with what I see going on around me in agencies and the pressures that are placed on practitioners, you know. Yeah. But the almost dehumanizing nature of some of the systems that we try and operate yeah. in. And the ethics of NVR are by its very nature rehumanizing, aren't they? That they, they, yeah. they reconnect and uh, reestablish interactional, relational, <laughs> um, yeah. healthy relationships. So I think we're working with this constantly, Peter. It's really important, actually, I think. And hoping to, and, and sometimes successfully, balance, rebalance and create um, a buffer mm. uh, between ourselves and the families that we work with and those dehumanizing tendencies that we sometimes see in an institutional context. Mm. I guess that's a theme for another podcast. I think it's a lovely theme for another podcast, isn't it? Yeah. Because how, yes, how do we show our resistance to that? You know, and yeah. I, I think this is connected to this, isn't it? Because these are acts of resistance when we talk, and I'm talking and we're talking about an overall theme of, of love, of, of, you know, all the nuances that that brings. But these are all practices of resistance to cultural um, pressures that we're all faced with. So yeah. it's really important, isn't it? If we're going to, on a, you know, a level that Martin Luther King was talking about transformation, this tra transformation of society, wasn't it? Yeah. So we refuse to participate in, in these acts that dehumanise and oppress people. And that yeah. extends in across so many parts of our lives and they might you know they might feel like you know you know what are they listeners might think you know they're talking about these great you know huge huge ideas but it it's beholden on all of us i think in our daily lives to be taking these steps if we are truly going to be working with nvr in a way that's authentic and consistent then i i have always felt that it's always about working on myself mm. as a person as a human being and what does that then allow you to bring into the therapy session with a person? You know, you're, you're going to be able to, I think, look at all these lovely nuances that you've referenced, Peter. You know, the example you gave, all of those little levels of love that parent was showing as he sat in its determined way and how that transformed that relationship with his daughter through continued acts like that. You know, but that's... Yeah, I don't know. I'm, I'm rambling now, but <laughs> yeah. I, I was, I was just sort of um, thinking about um, the way in which we've discussed um, loving responses in the NVR process on so many different levels and in so many different dimensions, and I. Something popped into my head that, um, and I don't, I can't quote it literally, but um, Mahatma Gandhi sort of at one point said that nothing could uh, induce him to take a human life. And I was thinking of the sanctity of life that we feel, of human life, of every individual's life, and not just not just you know their very existence but their uh, their integrity you know their um remaining unharmed mm -hmm. and that in in love we don't just think about that in an abstract way but we feel it and that feeling guides our actions it guides our restraint against hateful or, or escalating responses. 
Uh, and it also, though, uh, can guide our determination. Yeah. Mm. Oh, that's a really lovely summing up, Peter. Thank you okay. very much. And uh, thank you for the opportunity to have such a, a wonderful, rich, quite philosophical conversation. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> And thank you for coming on to the podcast. It's been lovely. Okay, so we'll say goodbye for now. Goodbye. <laughs>